Okay. Good evening, boys and ghouls, and to another delicious dollop of dread to satisfy your appetite for the terminally morbid. This is your master of ceremonies and deadly delights, Jonathan, and welcome back to CryptTube, where I introduce to you an all new segment on the channel I call Crypt's Interviews. We have a special guest today in the Crypt Kitties, Jason Stein, the host of the up and coming Tales podcast, Dads from the Crypt. Jason, dude, it's been a while since I've seen you, but since we talked, how are you, bro? I'm great. Yeah, it's been the minute you went off and did your training. Uh, so, you saw all the pictures. Look like you had a great, looks like you had a, a fun time. I guess you could call oh, it a God. grueling like, fun time. I guess fun would be the word to describe it. I mean, I could use other words. I don't want to go into yeah. the aspect of it, but yeah, will you will you use fun? <laughs> you you were my neck of the woods at least. So, oh yeah, yeah. I, trust me. I, I wish I was able to actually because I, I was in California, but I, mm -hmm. I wish I could have like you know gone off post and. Got to see what California had to offer for a little bit for the uh, I sat at three day exodus before mm. my I flew back home, but unfortunately they they didn't allow anybody to go off post. So mm, next time we'll get you. Yeah, absolutely. I would love it. So uh, Jason, uh, right now um, I want to do a quick intro introduction for uh, you, the podcast, and your associates. So um, tell me a little bit about yourself, Jason, and tell me about uh, how you met Mondo and uh, Jody. Yeah, so you know I'm. You run, I would say, run of the mill horrors fan, you know, grew up in the late 80s, 90s. Um, and uh, I watched Tales from the Crypt not even on HBO, but like on uh, Saturday nights when I was waiting for SNL to come on, they would post syndicated, edited episodes of Tales from the Crypt. And that's kind of how I first started watching the show. And you know, it scared the crap out of me, it got me hooked. Um, and then okay. you know, I and then, you know, the, the scream boom came on in the mid 90s. So that, that became like my my big epiphany moment. You know, I've been a horror fan ever since. And then, uh, you know, I've always wanted to be part of a horror community to some degree or be contributing. But I tried doing a little bit of blogging and some movie reviews and stuff. And then I never really could find the time or anything. I never I never thought it was very good per se. Um, but, you know, back even back then in the 2000s, I had an idea of doing a Tales from the Crypt uh, blog. To review every episode but you know just you know family stuff comes along you have kids you get married you know um and then fast forward through the 2010s and there's a, another horror podcast called uh bloody good horror that i got very into uh listening wise and um they have a slack channel which if you don't know what that is it's kind of like a private social media network yeah so i yeah a lot of organizations use it because it's you can choose it's invite only to like different communities. So like if you work for a small company and you want to have like a chat, social media kind of thing, you can okay. just invite your employees for free to come and be part of that. So it's very common. So they had the a Patreon where you could do, join the Slack for whatever amount. And um, what I actually was doing was uh, I started going to horror conventions in Southern California. And, you know, once you've been to a handful of them, it's kind of the same over and over. So I wanted to make like a, a in real life game out of it where I would go around and get the celebrities, the people that are doing uh, autographs and stuff to give shout outs to the Blake Horror Podcast because they have a bumper between segments that says, hi, I'm so-and-so. You're from blank. You're listening to Blake of Horror. So with their permission, I went around and uh, got some of those just kind of like guerrilla style where just, you know. Just, you know, people who I'm sure did not know what the podcast was, like Judith O'Day from Night of Living Dead, you know, just really random people. Um, anyway, so that's kind of how I got into that Slack group and kind of got friends with them. And then, um, you know, Slack was really overwhelming at first because a lot of people just kind of been talking and they're all like in their own little conversations. And then pandemic happened. And at that point, we're all just kind of looking for as much social interaction, not in person, <laughs> that we can get. Yeah, absolutely. So a, a group of us decided to start doing trivia nights. So like every Saturday for like two years, we did a horror trivia. Um, and that's where, you know, I got really good friends with the guy who ran the trivia named Jody and this other guy, Mondo. Um, and like I could tell we all just really clicked and, you know, became really good friends, with a lot of people through there. And then, um, you know, I think around the second year or so, you know, um, our other friend, Caitlin from Blade of Horror started her own podcast called Plug It Up. Uh, which was talks about in the feminine horror movies and from that perspective, uh, great podcast. I recommend everyone listen to it. And I saw the work that she was doing. And I'm like, you know, 
and she had the support of the blood and horror and everything. I'm like, I feel like I could do something like that, but I mean, I, I don't think I could do it, but you know, I know this guy, Jody, and this guy, Mondo. So I bet you the three of us could do the work that she does on her own because <laughs> she's just so amazing. So, um, so basically I just, in the way I am, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I do project management work and everything in IT. I created a PowerPoint presentation of like my proposal and uh, presented it to each of them. I, uh, so I did that and they both like said, you know, you had us at Tales of the Crypt podcast, you know, they, they were kind of on board immediately and everything else was just kind of window dressing. But to me, it, uh, the process helped out working through, working out things in my head. Um, and what I didn't know at the time was I couldn't have, not only could I have picked like the best people, like they're just amazing people and the kindest, nicest guys and supportive, but I unintentionally picked Jody who, um, does graphic design for his job in web design. So that was a huge help. And then Mondo is a very technical person and he's fine doing all the editing, all the technical aspects. So we actually completely inadvertently like came up with this great division of labor because it's really cool to be able to just shoot something to Jody and say, Hey, can you do X, Y, and Z with this? And you know, he, he can do a pretty good turnaround depending on what's going on. And then Mondo, I never have to, I don't like listening to some of my voice. So once we record, I never have to listen to anything ever again, which is fine by me. Right. So Mondo goes in and does all the editing and stuff. So I have to deal with that. And they're both like, Jason, if you handle the organizational parts and the guests and the social aspects, we're fine. We'll never, we'll never complain about doing uh, these other things. Um, you guys were able to find each other and you guys all have something different to offer and put mm-hmm. on in order to make your podcast work. And that, I think that's amazing. That's, that's magical. Yeah, it just literally happened that way. And then, but we all have very similar tastes and opinions, you know, not completely the same because we don't want to be like three people saying the same thing, but we, t- we just have very similar sensibilities, but we have a lot, we each have different uh, skill sets. Because I'm like, I'm the big, I'm a big picture, big idea kind of person. Um, I come up with all kinds of crazy stuff and I have bounce it around to them and say, hey, what do you guys think of this? And sometimes I'm like, eh, that might be a bit much. Gotcha. gotcha. They, they usually don't say no, but. <laughs> you know, I, I I want their feedback to know if I'm like, you know, going biting off more than I can chew. But they're always supportive. And, you know, it's been we've been around for a year and a half now. Um, and it's been amazing. That is that is awesome. I'm I'm glad you guys were able to find each other. I just want to reiterate that because like you guys have been pulling in episodes upon episodes of reviews, and not only that, but you've also been hitting interviews with key players from the franchise, you know, of Tales. And it, it it shows that like, you know, when it comes down to even the graphic design art, the the editing of your podcast, even with videos that you guys post of, of your podcast. And even then, like, you know, just the way you guys interview, like the style of interviewing is so in depth. You guys, you actually do, it almost seems like you guys do like real, really good thorough research before you even have your guests on. Yeah, I mean, I try, so it's so funny. So the, we when we first started doing interviews, um, so when I went into this whole thing, I said, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to make this the best, most definitive Tales of podcast I can, or else why, 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 what am I doing here? Um, you know, so I'm going to try, I'm not, I'm going to, I don't want to leave any stone unturned, um, you know, within, within all within, you know, reason. So like I got an INDB pro account so I could find people's agents and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the first interviews that we requested was obviously John Kassir and William Sadler. And both of them said yes. Both of their agents said yes within like an hour or two. And I'm like, really? I was like, am I being punked? Is this kind of camera for <laughs> other generations? Uh, I, I couldn't quite believe it at first. And I'm like, wait, how do I do an interview? It's like, you know, you want something, but you don't quite know how to do it once you do it. So I very quickly had to figure out like, how to do an interview and also i didn't want to do i want to do an interesting interview i do one that they would enjoy and not just have it be like so what what do you like about stuff you know i wanted to be like i wanted to be entertaining for them entertaining for listeners i didn't want to regurgitate so actually i was talking to a bunch of people and what they said was um you know try to think up the the, not just the first question but like the follow-up question kind of things try to ask the second question you would ask someone about a topic because you know probably what the first answer is going to be or something like that. Yeah, basically. Like did was, cuff, right? I'm sorry? Basically, like, off the cuff, like, basically, based off their previous... Kind of, yeah, like, you know, people put so much stuff out there. So, like, John Kassir, I went to his 
Twitter and I saw that he like he's from Baltimore and he likes the Baltimore Ravens. So I came up with some Baltimore Ravens questions. And um, what I did was uh, people said I should watch the hot stuff. Um, those interviews with, on uh, YouTube where the guy, the, he has celebrities and they eat like hot wings um, and, does, and does interviews. But like to look at how he asked the questions and what kind of questions he asked. So, you know, try to do that. And then, um, you know, there's some, again, we're, we're in such an interconnected state these days where I can like post to like Reddit or uh, toast like a board and say, Hey, I'm interviewing this person. What would you like me to ask him? So the listeners have input too. Um, but what's, what's so funny is for, so especially for John Casier, so I came up with a list of like 40 questions. It's like everything I could think of, but John, if you ever listen to an interview, he's such an entertaining, energetic guy that like he just talks and talks and talks and you're just sitting there eating it up. I only got through, I got through less than 10 questions. <laughs> because he just kept going and going and he, he answered the all, most of the questions I wanted to ask. And he's just so entertaining and charismatic that like, I was just sitting back and letting him go and tell stories and just like tr- trying not to crack up too much. Cause he was so damn funny. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really, I always try to over prepare for an interview. I always want to have too many questions. Um, you should always have too much. You should always have things left over that you didn't get to or that turned out weren't relevant or got answered organically. Right. Um, and that's a lesson I kind of learned from that. Good, and good. Then, go ahead. No, no, I was going to comment off that because, like, yeah. you know, me trying to interview you, I, I feel the same exact thing. So I already had pre made questions, like, put up for, me, for myself to give you. And I'm kind of, like, trying to roll off the cuff with that. But I don't – I also want to try to make it a little bit more personal as mm-hmm. opposed to just make, being about business and talking about the same thing. So that's why I'm trying yeah. to like, go off – uh, yeah. you know, telling me and just trying to make it a little bit more connected. Yeah. Or another person that I listen to a lot is Mark Marin, his podcast where he, you know, he talks to a lot of the major people, but he always gets like, if they'll let him, they'll, he'll try to get a little deeper and a little more personal. Some people are, are really guarded when they interview him or when he interviews them. Um, and they're just not willing to go there and that's fine. But you know, some people, he, he can usually get them to open up. People are usually are willing uh, to open up, especially when they're talking about their craft or their projects or their life's work um so yeah the interviews you know it's just more icing on the cake because we've I've got to talk to so many amazing people um and build you know some friendships friendships with some of them you know and um like you know i'm sure you want to talk about Al cats you know it's just been like crazy the journey that we've gone on together mm-hmm. yes yes we are going to discuss Al cats but we're going to take that a little bit further into yep, the interview yeah. uh, because you mentioned uh one of your inspirations was to try to make your podcast like one of the uh, the more go-to podcast in terms of tales information, but not only tales information, but horror in general, and just you know overall, you know, community, uh, you know, connectivity. So mm-hmm. uh, when I kind of want to uh, ask further into that question is like, you know, what exactly is the goal and intent aside from that? Do you have anything else that you want to try to provide uh, the tales community? Um, it's always kind of a moving target in a way. Um, you know, I think because we kind of our offshoot of like the blade and horror and we're connected with all these other podcasts that they're kind of connected to. We're all kind of one family. So I'm always trying to bring people up, you know, even if your podcast has like, I don't know how many we, we, we've all had low, we've all started off with, you know, from nothing. Um, so I'm always trying to bring people on or people message me and I'm always happy to work with them uh, to promote their stuff. I don't have, I wouldn't say I have like a goal goal, but um, it's always, we're always trying to evolve. Um yeah. We, uh, you know, one, one of the things I didn't really think that we would get into would be YouTube, but you know, a lot, everyone keeps saying, yeah, it's just another thing you gotta do, you know, the YouTube and all the social media and, um, you know, we have an interesting little YouTube crowd. The algorithm is very interesting because we have like 300 plays on some things and 30 plays on others and who knows what or why, or what, what the rhyme or reason is. Hashtags, but, clicks, you know, whatever. Yeah, who knows? But um, we actually have, uh, when is this coming out? Uh, this right now, uh, I plan on putting this out either tonight or tomorrow. Like, oh, uh, wow. That's quick. Editing, right now, I'm also mixing up like my last Crypt discussion with uh, the Casper uh, cameo of the Crypt Keeper. So uh, oh, cool. I'm wrapping that up and then I'm going to try to mix this either by today or tomorrow. Okay. So I guess I'll announce it here as well that we actually have a new thing that we're trying out for YouTube. Um, it's interesting. I... You know, I, I go, I'm sure as I know you do, we both go through the hashtags when people hashtag Tales of the Crypt on Instagram. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah. So, you know, I always like to find interesting things that people are posting. So someone posted that they had like some memorabilia that they just bought. So I started uh, DMing with them about it. Okay. And it turns out this guy is like a major, I don't major, but a, a very enthusiastic collector of uh, screen used movie props. Okay. So he, and he, he offered to give me a zoom tour of his collection because he has a whole basement decked out. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Can I record it? Can I make that into a thing? And he's like, yeah, sure. So we actually have a new segment that should be coming out this week called uh, Vault of Horror Collectors. I like that. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Because everyone does blank of the crypt. So I want them to switch it up a little bit. So basically, <clears throat> there's this guy. So basically, we're going to be talking to different collectors who have um, screen used collections of movie props and masks and, you know, whatever they got. And they're going to kind of give us a tour. So we get to kind of see what they have. So the guy I talked to today, uh, Patrick Hardy, um, he had amazing collection, mind blowing. He has the alien tongue from alien three that they actually used in the iconic shot where it, like sticks out her t- the tongue at, uh, at Ripley. Right. So he actually just has that as a prop that he has yeah. in this collection. I'd love to see yeah, that. It, yeah. It's really fucking cool. Um, and you know, it's, it's a whole subculture unto itself of people who are spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, if not, I'm sure much more than that on, yeah. on single, on single items. Um, <laughs> so to me, I find that fascinating and it's, you know, all horror and stuff. So I'm just into it in general. Um, and you know, we'll po- probably get a bunch of more people to come on there and, um, yeah, so I'm a horror fan, you know, I, as much as I talk about Tales of the Crypt, I'm a big fan, but I've never, I would never say I'm a, like obsessed with Tales of the Crypt. Um, it's just, you know, I'm a big fan, but you know, I'm, I'm not like one of those people that's just continuously watching episodes over and over and over again. Like, I'm sure there's people who are bigger fans of Tales of the Crypt than I am. Right, right. Um, but you know, I love all things horror. So it's, it's all up there in my alley. So, you know, who knows where this is all going to go, but you know, I'm just enjoying the ride and just trying to give people content that they enjoy. Hey, either way, whether you, you know, you watch the, uh, the videos or the, the episodes every so often, the films, mm-hmm. like religiously, a fan's a fan. That's where yeah. I see it. You know, it, it, it is what it is. So, I mean, uh, you have those true diehard fans. You have the ones that, you know, just casually watch it. Like, eh, I, like, I remember Tales from the Crypt in the 90s. You know, that kind of fan. Regardless, a fan's a fan. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, like, I'm a huge... I will say I'm a huge Demon Knight fan. Oh, like, yeah, everyone like, loves I'm, Demon Yeah, like, I'm up there with... Uh, uh, yeah, Exactly. Well, I've got my, um, I, sh- I showed you the Demon Knight cover I had um, framed and everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you did. Yeah, so that, that's my that's my big piece of memorabilia. It's not like memorabilia per se, but. I also have a couple of uh, memorabilia myself, uh, either sent to me by uh, other fans from France or just stuff that I bought myself. Like uh, yeah. the novel, the novel that no one really talks about, which they should. Yeah, I have it downloaded. I, I read part of it. And then you also have um, the album, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not done, CD. So yeah. Here, I'll show you but on this way if, I, if it works. Let me turn this off. Uh, just virtual background, a little bit done. Ah, uh, yes, signed and everything. Yeah, so we have Billy Zane, Ernest Dickerson, uh, Todd Masters. Um, and then Ethan and Cyrus, the uh, screenwriters. That's awesome. That, that's a great collection of uh, signatures on that cover. Yeah. And then I had it, and I took it to Michael's, got a nice mounting on it. So I, I wish I had more of the opportunity to go to conventions and meet these individuals myself as well. Like, you know, I, I would love to get a lot of things signed. Yeah. It's, like- it's a perk of living in here, living in uh, LA, but it's also really gets really expensive very quickly. Oh, sure, it is. Uh, the only signed memorabilia I have for Demon Knight is this card right here. An artist card, if I can get it to focus and get the glare. Yeah. Okay. Was a that signed, Voss? Yeah, Mike Vosberg's uh, Mike Mark, yeah. for Hollywood Crypt Keeper. Oh, cool. That's very that, cool. That right there is my price piece for uh, mm. Demon Knight memorabilia. <sighs> But enough, no, enough of me showing off stuff than, you know, like we're talking yeah. about. Uh, uh, let's get this back into the interview. Uh, into the interview. Um, so we discussed goals and intents. Um, and as you know, we already have like a very, very small um, 
community as is, and we have very limited sources for uh, Tales information. Um, when it came down to your podcast, what what has it been like to get some like some of the most pivotal key players of the Tales franchise? And it, look, I, I'm, I'm going to name drop here. We got yeah, William uh-huh. James Sadler, uh, John Kassir, Ernest Dickerson, Todd Masters. We, we both did an interview with Todd Masters. You followed up with another interview, I believe. Uh, Alan Katz, Gil Adler, all these prominent players in, in the franchise. What, what's that feeling like as a, as a diehard Crypt fan? I mean, well, we already discussed levels of, of Crypt, uh, Crypt mania, but um, to be able to interact with these individuals and digging up dirt, so to speak, on the franchise. I mean, it's probably going to sound cliche, but I feel so, I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for anyone that will talk to me <laughs> about it, um, you know, and, but I think there's also people who are happy to talk about it because this is something they did like 30 years ago and they've done so many things since, but, you know, I think everyone knew it was special. So it, hold, it holds a intricate, int- or intrinsic special place for them. Um, you know, it was one of William Sadler's first big breaks. And then, you know, the movie was one of those like first, not first big movies, but like a big part of his career so i think he's just william sadler's just the nicest guy um yes, I, I, i've heard i've heard he is, that with your interview with him and he sounds like a down-to-earth dude he is so cool like he it's funny because i asked his agent like um you know is he doing any conventions anytime soon as he come out the west coast you know um we're, we're always looking to get like signatures and stuff and his agent's like well let me get back to you his agent gave me his address to send him a package and to send, you know, a handful of items, wow. like not stuff that like I'm going to resell or anything, but, um, you know, and that was just, I was like, really? <laughs> and he gave me like, I'm talking to like, but this, burn, this address burn not get out anywhere or anything. Um, and if William Sather does you something like that, you're like, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, you've talked to all these directors, you know, that, you know, never, never, no one, no one, very few people have done just tell script, nothing else. You know, they all went on to do stuff or they all did stuff before. So, you know, Manny Cotto, Jack Shoulder, um, John Harrison, who did, you know, um, Tales from the Dark Side. And, you know, it's just, it's mind boggling. So it's just mind blowing. Like if I told myself five years ago, 10 years ago, when I was a kid, that I would get to talk to people like um, probably well, my favorite episodes as far as scariness is uh, the new arrival. Mm-hmm. Um, the one with uh, the psychologist goes to see the little girl and everything. Girl turns out to be like a ghoul or whatever. When I saw that as a kid, that scared the shit out of me. Like I stayed up with my lights on that night until I just probably passed out. And I was like in middle school. So <laughs> we're not talking like I was a little kid. Um, at least I thought I, I didn't think I, I was a little kid. But I was like, you know what? I want to find out who played the little girl and I want to, I want to try to talk to her or him or whoever that was. And I was able to figure it out and I did an interview and it was like almost empowering, like revealing behind the mask. Oh yeah. And it turns out it was this actress um, who does stunt doubling for lots of um, kids. So she worked on like the Goonies and Jurassic Park uh, cause she's short in stature. Um, and she has this amazing stunt career. She was in like Halloween four for Jamie Lloyd. Um, and then Daniel Harris. Uh, so it's just, it was just so cool to talk to this person who, you know, is just I, the embodiment of something that had a very major effect on me and to just be like, you know, to talk to that person and just, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a time machine in, in a way. I may be getting the name wrong. Uh, like, did and I'm she terrible. Have... And I'm sorry. I'm terrible with names too. No, 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 no. Like, like, like I, I'm because I'm thinking of the individual you're talking about. Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, maybe I invented the name wrong. Debbie Carrington. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, she, she, she'd also had been uh, uh, doing stunt work for like the Chucky movies. No, she didn't do Chucky. I know that. Uh, I can look it up, I, but. Um, but uh, this is, I'm sure, great dead air. The new arrival, Laura Dash, which is an awesome name for a stunt actress. Laura Dash, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the How to Not Make Your Movie podcast. You know that is that that was one of the the biggest things when it came down to uh, your podcast 
making moves as as it is right now, which we're going to comment a little bit later on that. But how did that collaboration come about? Like, were you talking to Alan one day and you just offered a platform for him and uh, Gil to discuss Bordello? Like, how did that happen? Yeah. So, again, I was just looking for anyone, anybody that would talk, talk tales because, you know, no, once you kind of go with the first couple people, you're like, OK, we're, we're, what's our next one? What's our next slew? So um, Alan Katz is very active on Twitter um, with his um, in the, with his activism, yes. um, political activism, and his DMs were open. So I was like, you know what, I'm I'm, I'm take a shot and uh, see what happens. Yep. You know, one of the things I've learned is you know, it's fine if someone says no. It, it's bad if you never try. Worst thing if you ask someone, best thing that happens is they say yes. Worst things that happens is they no. If you don't try, you'll never know one way or the other uh you know don't be a fucking creep about it but <laughs> yes yes and we have a lot of people who just you know i already had a moment earlier today where someone was being a creep but that that, that I, I digress yeah but, no i just but yeah people always say like oh follow your dream don't take no for an answer i'm like mm, sometimes you should take no for an answer read the room yeah exactly um but alan was immediately like yeah sure i'll talk to you whatever and you know i think once he saw the concept he saw the humor that we were kind of interjecting dad's crib because there was like, you know, the first generation of tell the crypt fans, you know, the people who watched who were older old enough to really watch it when the first came out were fans. But then I think there was kind of our younger generation, the second wave or whatever you want to call it, who watched this kids. And now we're older. A lot of us are parents, or at least we're like at an age where we're looking back on the, on it with nostalgia. Um, so I think he saw that like now might be a ripe time to kind of, you know, dive back into this. And as we know, you know, Alan was a producer on the show and a screenwriter for Bordello Blood. But after, you know, a lot after all that happened, he went into this because of what happened with a lot that went on with the movie. He went through a big writing block and a major depression uh, episode for many, many, many years. Um, he decided to just kind of step away from everything, go be with his kids. Uh, which is a story I've actually heard a lot lately from a lot of people. Um, and then, like, he decided he wants to write all this stuff down because he has all these amazing experiences. So he kind of wrote an outline for the How Not to Make a Movie, Making a Bordello of Blood. He kind of had that written down as a manuscript. Right. But he thought the best way to advertise that or to hash that out would be to do it kind of in a podcast form. And that's, I think, I'm not claiming to be the inspiration for him to do any of this, but I think once I talked to him and he kind of saw how I did it, he's like, oh, I can use this guy to help me figure out how to do it. He, yep. he needed some guidance on you know the technical aspects and kind of how to work everything. So, yes. you know, he, we sat down, we did the whole interview. Um, and, you know, of course, I want to talk about Bordeaux Blood and his reaction was, that's a bigger story. We'll get to that one at some awesome. another point. And, you know, as an interviewer, you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> it was very yeah. cryptic. And I was like, okay. And then afterwards, he's like, you know, I've got this idea for this whole podcast to talk about it. And in my head, I was like, you know, we can do like an hour on it and we'll call it good or whatever. But no, he had like a 10 part mini series, like all wrapped down in his head. But he needed he, he basically called me. He calls me his executive producer because he runs, you know, we kind of went through many iterations together. And, um, you know, I give him feedback. Most of it, he. He, he justifies and I'm like, I'm like, okay, but he wants, but again, when he's at his point, he wants a, another perspective on it, the listener perspective. And that's kind of how he sees me in a lot of things. So someone who is, has been a creator in this format and also as a fan. Um, so he's using kind of, he's totally using me and that's fine. Cause you know, you, you've used him plenty. It's a mutual, yeah. you know, relationship. Um, so I can give him guidance and perspective that he doesn't have anymore. Um, on what people want to listen to, what people want to hear. And then, you know, we we get him to do little bits for a lot of our episodes. We call him Uncle Al's Corner. I like that. He's, yeah. He's, you know, he's a French family. And, you know, I've had lunch with him a couple of times. And he's come by my house to work on some stuff together. You know, we, we text each other <laughs> all throughout the week. We're kind of in connection. Um, and, you know, we help him out with whatever he needs. And, um, you know, uh, we did actually set up a, um, there was a screening of Demon Knight, which I've never actually seen Demon Knight on the, in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, I saw there was going to be a screening um, and I talked to the organizers, I was just, hey, I'm with this podcast. You know, I know Alan, who is a producer. I've talked to the guys who are the screenwriters. Would you be interested in setting up like a Q&A? And they're like, sure, yeah, so let's do it. So 
I set up everything and I had everything set, set to go. And then like two days before I came, I got, uh, came out with COVID. Oh, and it was, God. it was devastating. <laughs> I was so oh, mad. I was so upset. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, but, you know, that's, that's the, the world we live in and, you know, no one, thankfully no one, no one died on my end and I didn't cause anyone else to get sick. So, um, worse things have happened. But um, yeah, we have a, a amazing friendship that we built throughout all this. And I'm I'm happy to hear that, and, that, and that's great news to, to hear that you have developed a relationship with AL Cats. I mean, not only in terms of uh, the Tales franchise, but also on a personal level, and, and that's good, you know, because like we need stuff like that nowadays, especially when you know the level of communication, and not only that, but also connections with people seems to be dwindling lately. At least that's what I'm noticing, but. You know, yeah, just to be yeah. able to connect with somebody on that kind of level, you know, when you were complete perfect strangers is a great thing to know and great thing to find out. Yeah. I mean, whenever I interview someone, I try to make them feel as welcome as possible. And I say, hey, you know, you've done this me this great favor. You know, I'm not really I'm not making any money off of this. You're not making any money. You know, maybe I'm, I might want to be able to, look, to listen to stuff and go watch their other other stuff. That's my that's my hope for them. Right. Um, but I tell them, you know, if anything I can do for you. And, you know, I've actually, sometimes I'll circle back with someone like, you know, a friend of mine that had his 40th birthday and he's a huge John Harrison soundtrack fan. So I was able to get John Harrison to sign a soundtrack for him. Hell so yeah. that was, that was just amazing. So in, in terms of the overall podcast, you know, uh, collaboration you're doing with Gil and, you know, Al, um, what was the most interesting tidbit uh, for you in terms of hearing Gil and Al's story, in terms of Bordello's production and the series itself, because uh, from all the from, from the episodes that I've uh, I've listened to, Gil was very reluctant on speaking about Bordello. <laughs> period, um, until he was until he was uh, able to talk about it with uh, with uh, Cats, and he was able to talk about it with Kassir and uh, Jaeger. Mm-hmm. Um, because we've all had, we've, we've all heard the horror stories behind that, that movie's production, um, uh, ever since the Bordello Blu-ray came out, but what was your perspective in it all when you first heard all this information? Yeah. I mean, I had no idea the extent of it all, but I mean, we've all failed at something. We've all had our, ex- or been through experiences that did not go how we wanted it or how we expected it and it just blew up in our face. You know, you're in the yeah. armed services. I'm sure that happens. Uh, you do everything you can to avoid it, but you know, shit happens. Yeah, um, cool. Unfortunately, most of it doesn't happen to most of us with like a 20 million, whatever it is budget. And, you know, in front of the entire, you know, Hollywood industry and, you know, an international movie franchise. Mm-hmm. So that must've been, this whole experience was obviously very traumatic. Um, and I think that they were, you know, whenever you go through a traumatic experience on any level, you know, you, Harvey wants to forget about it and just put it back in the back of your head, never want to talk about it again, but it's always kind of going to be there. So I think the first reaction, when someone brings up anything, you know, if someone brings up something traumatic in your past, you're like, fuck, I don't want to talk about that. I don't yeah. want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. But, you know, after, you know, that's your first reaction. But then once I think once you realize and someone, you know, like you're going in therapy or something, somebody wants to help you work through it. I think they, I think that's the realization thing a lot of people came to is, is yeah that really sucked, you know that was a really bad memory but you know here's a chance to kind of work through, you know that bad experience and let's see if we can like recontextualize and look at it with fresh eyes and you know have a laugh at it and kind yeah. of you know, take back some of that and you know yeah it's just a movie but these are people's careers these are people's reputations that were put on the line some people that had their marriages put on the line. Um, and it's the, the what, what I love most is the Joel Silver character. It's like he it doesn't sound like a real person to me. Yeah, like I, I was I was listening to those interviews and I was listening to that those episodes and I was just like, the podcast yours and Al's were kind of putting a light on Joel Silver, a side of him that a lot of people I don't think would would even suspect is a thing not to mention to the general public who are on the outside of the bubble looking game when it comes to hollywood um well i think you, you see like tropic thunder and you see like the mega producer megalomaniac and i don't think that yeah. wasn't directly about joel silver it was definitely that type and you kind of you look at that and you, and you laugh but then you start realizing no that's not a complete caricature yeah yeah i mean like you know there's i mean because what what is what's the general expression there's always true to a joke 
Yeah, there's always the kernel of truth. And we we all knew it was bad when it comes down to Hollywood production companies and you know some of the people who are the uh, the top heads in Hollywood. We always knew mm-hmm. that there was always that kind of level of bad. But when you actually hear it in the interviews and you hear from not just one person, but it's validated by numerous people, you're just like, okay, so we're actually starting to paint a picture here. And um, but what were your initial thoughts when it came to finding out about the that situation and how most of the crew perceived him? Oh, it was again for something that happened many years ago that I have no association with, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> you know, it was it was funny and tragic, but also let's say that we're not talking about like a Harvey mm. Weinstein situation. No, uh, no. We're, we're, we're talking, you know, just a really, you know, controlling, you know, powerful man, <laughs> uh, producer. Um, but I thought, I, to me, again, because I got to listen to these, I had to listen to them multiple times. So to me, the, t- the thing that, that I found the best that I look forward to was all like the Joel Silver stuff, like hearing all the stories that everyone else is going through are very touching and really interesting. But it was the, always the Joel Silver stuff that I always thought was the funniest. It like, always got my attention to the point where I'm like, I kind of want to do if I had the time, I want to do a Joel Silver podcast where I just find people that Joel Silver worked with. Oh, that would be great. And be- uh, collect stories because I just it's just such a larger than life true you know personality uh you know honestly after all after all this time i'm really shocked that we have not seen some kind of joel silver biopic someday maybe i mean oh, maybe okay. he's still he's still kicking so maybe he, um someday yeah and, and uh i want to go back to an episode of tales real quick because like mm-hmm. in, re- in relevance to silver i kind of like when I, as soon as i finished the episodes uh especially the last few with uh jaeger um, I thought about it and I was just like, I went back to split second, you know, you know, the, uh, the, uh, Crick Keeper segment at the end where he's, oh, where he's co- about, yeah, it's my producer. We chainsaw him in half. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was kind of thinking, did, did they have some kind of manifestation, uh, wishful thinking in that, <laughs> <laughs> that segment? <laughs> uh, I mean, I know it was in jest. I know it wasn't serious. Like, you know, who, I who, think. Who, to get ch- chained up you know what i'm saying well but, i think i think on the, on the on another level it shows you that he still has like a sense of humor about it all yes, yes. it's kind of thing where like yeah you can't be like a billion dollar movie producer uh without have with, you know without being a real jerk to, to, to some people but also without you know being have some some sense of humor to it right 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 there's always no it has to be some kind of level of humor when it comes down to the situation and you know like i guess when you're running you know, production companies, or you have like that kind of like responsibility, I guess, to some degree, you there, there always has to be a level of assholeism. Mm-hmm. That, obviously, it's not a word, but you, you know what I'm getting at. You know, I got you. I agree. So like when you're when you're running something, you got to make sure things are tight. However, based on, you know, what we've heard, you know, it almost seems like there was a little bit more of an excess of that level of assholeism. Yeah. Again, we're, we're only speculating on what we've heard from uh, other accounts so right right yeah i mean we're only hearing what we're hearing and you know obviously if, if joel silver is listening to this then no no no, 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 no. We're sorry i mean no, no disrespect to joel silver. the man has brought us a lot of great entertainment and whatnot that's not like I, i'm not saying he's an asshole asshole i'm, I'm just saying like when good because you know you know how it's like there's necessary evil and there's evil mm-hmm. they, 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 there's that there's that fine line there and yeah. you know in no way does that mean is, is that a shot towards Joel Silver? It, it's almost like okay, so we had the Joel Silver story, and then we had the um, oh god, um, Dennis Miller story. Yeah, you know, like, and you know, Dennis Miller was a hard time to work with. You know, made production a, a much more of a hassle than it needed to be. When he, you know, he needed to be there. No, he was going to do uh, his Dennis Miller live show, you know, stuff like that. You know, just stuff like that that made production a little bit harder. That's mm-hmm. all. Um, but yeah, that, that that's just my my perception, my my two cents on that. But um, let's get to something else that a lot of the fans don't really know when it comes to your podcast. Your podcast was just featured in Entertainment Weekly. How did that? How, how did that feel? <laughs> Yeah, my joke about that one is I didn't know Entertainment Weekly was still a thing outside of dentist offices. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so 
one completely out of the blue, we got an email from this guy who's a um, editor writer for Entertainment Weekly, which I guess is also is has does a lot of website stories. Right. And they said, "Hey, I, I'm a I'm a horror fan, um, and I want to. I heard about the how not to make a podcast, uh, how to, how to not make a movie podcast, and I'd like to talk to Alan Gill. Could you give me their their contact information?" Which I love that I was the one I was Entertainment Weekly thought I was the best person to get a hold of these like Hollywood producers. Like that, that, yes, you are the gatekeeper. I know. I thought that was really funny. Oh, to the door. Um, and of course, and I and before I pass along Alan's information, of course, I'm going to ask him. So he's like, "Yeah, sure, of course." So you know, I, I am I message the person back. Well, here's his email. You know, he'd be happy to talk to you. And by the way, would you like to be a guest on our podcast, the, the Dash of the Crypt? Because that's one of the other things. So, like, we have like a couple different, two different levels where we have like the interviews with people who worked on the show, you know, and those are like, you know, dedicated interviews. And then we have our episode reviews and with me, Mondo, and Jody. But then I usually like to try to have someone come and join us, either a friend, a horror community uh, person, uh, another podcaster, et cetera. And I was trying to pull in other people I think might be interesting. So I'm like, hey, why don't you come be on our pod? He's like, oh, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's I, I'm a bit of an opportunist in that way. If I see an opportunity, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go for it. And we've had some really amazing guests. Um, we have we've we've had the director of Psycho Goreman um, came on and did the episode with us. Uh, which is, you know, one of my favorite movies the last couple of years. Uh, Stephen Kilkansky and. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, I passed along the information that he uh, talked to Alan Gill, and uh, you know, we got a little shout out in their interview. So they did an interview about you know the the how not to make a movie podcast and everything, and they kind of you know they they got out there and we got a little a little shout out in there, and you know, it's just one of those things that just kind of another little thing I never in a million years would thought would happen that just kind of happened on this little ride that we're on. That's awesome, and you know, um, it kind of reminds me of, like when. Uh... Because we, we used to talk about, like earlier in the days when you first started out, like, you know, like what would what would it be like to go big and whatnot? And, you know, all of a sudden, like, do you think uh, you would still remain as uh, humble in terms of how you approach the channel and how you would uh, go about, you know, doing your interviews? Or would you try to go bigger and try to make it a little bit more, you know? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, I'm just trying to stick to I'm just trying to stick to the the kind of charter for lack of a better word our mission our mission statement of just trying to make the best tales of the crypt podcast that we can and you know keep it fun for our audience fun for us if it's not fun for us then i don't want to do it um if it's not something i think the fans are going to enjoy i don't i'm not going to i don't want to put it out there mm-hmm. um and everything else is just like I said, everything else is icing on the cake you know, unless if somebody wants to like bring a buttload of cash to my house and say you can quit your job and just do this full time, you know, fuck yeah. I mean, but, sure, who, uh, who wouldn't? Yeah, exactly. Who wouldn't want to do this? And no. I know plenty of much more talented people who do much more work than I do, um, <laughs> who probably deserve a lot more credit. Um, so yeah, I'm just we have like I said, we have to cover our baseline, and then everything else just kind of comes and goes. And it's Halloween, uh, it's October, so it's Halloween season, so. You know, there's definitely going to be an uptick in interest in things. So we're just trying to put out stuff that people like and try to find the, the important thing is to keep a balance between, you know, the podcasting and my personal family life, my work life, and, you know, my time playing Red Dead Redemption 2. If I can get all those things in, in check. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Like A, check. B, check. C, check. Yep. Everything is good. Yeah. Yep. I'm all for that. Um, and but, um and i'm very grateful to my wife for being as supportive as she is well because she sees how how much i enjoy it and how much you know how much joy it brings to me which probably makes me a happier person to be around in general so yeah yeah we all we all that, that's I yeah i wouldn't be able to do it without her that's that's for sure yeah i, I know what that's like your your wife and my wife will have a lot of things in common because uh all this tales memorabilia the chucky memorabilia like like if I didn't have my wife or if I didn't have someone who was like my wife to support this kind of stuff, I, I probably wouldn't be here. Yeah. But um, let's get a little bit more on the Friday side of things. 
Um, <laughs> I was going to do uh, real quick, you know, off the cuff questions, like, you know, quick, quick shot ones. Um, favorite tale season and episode. Oh, God. Um, that's really hard because um, uh, probably season three. Yeah, I'm just looking at them right now. My my go to answer for favorite episode is yellow. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just it's got the biggest scope of any episode. It's obviously longer than any episode. Robert Zemeckis, and then the father son dynamic is just so genuine and just so affecting. And that's one I'm, I very distinctly remember watching that episode when I was a kid, and it just like blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also got Carrie and Death, which is a classic episode. Um, top billing is another one of my very very favorite episodes um morning mess split second you know there's so many great episodes i think that might be a peak in the way I and mean, each episode has has definitely has the peaks mm -hmm. uh which is funny because the very first episode in that season love to death is one of the episodes i like the least it's like a love fashion episode which just oh, yeah, really, yeah which doesn't really hold over very well but um, I got to do some of my favorite um, interviews for this one because so for we did the trap and I got Bruce McGill, Bruce McGill, yeah, um, D Day from Animal House. I got to interview him, and then for Top Billing, I got to interview Todd Holland, uh, who directed that, and uh, The Wizard, which again is another movie I grew up on. Again, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people that made the stuff that I grew up on as a kid, and that's just tickles me to no end. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what's your what is your favorite season? Uh, my favorite season, I, I'm very fond of season two. I, I yeah. don't know what season two. Season two, it it had that element of you know horror, but it also had a slight bit of comeuppance and humor in the situations. Like most mm -hmm. of it was straight up horror and like you know just psychological stuff, versus where the later seasons it just got more comical as they went. Which, yeah. you know, I appreciated because, you know, like in the comics, you know, where they had that kind of level of um, uh, humor in the situations. But at the same time, like, you know, season two seemed more grounded. Yeah, it's also the longest. So you have the most variety to pick from. Yes, yes. And with all with most of the episodes and whatnot, they had a lot of relatable situations that you can really um, take in mm -hmm. as like not as a a moment of like, oh uh, God, I'm losing the word now. Basically, like you, you knew for a fact, like, yes, this was a TV show, but this this kind of content almost felt relatable to somebody who was viewing it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. Three's, a crowd, Three's a Crowd was a, was my all time favorite episode, it still is. Mm. And the reason being is because like, you have a man who is, you know, paranoid about the fact that his wife is sleeping with another man. And this dude is coveting his wife with gifts you know, holding her, holding her, her thigh, holding, like placing his hand on her, on her knee. And that, that messes with a man who's, you know, who's very, um, who has a vital connection about the idea of like, this is my wife, this is my marriage that you're messing with. However, it takes a dark turn for the worst when he decides to kill his wife and people do this in, in real, in the real world, they kill their, uh, their wife or their, uh, the wife's lover out of passion Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you find out my wife was pregnant. She, I, I just killed my wife and my unborn child. Yeah. And there was no actual reason to validate the fact that I was even one suspicious and two murder. Right. And, and that's an interesting character study because he's obviously has a lot more issues than just jealousy. Oh yeah, um, because he's shown he's shown drinking continuously throughout the episode. It's been awesome. We haven't watched this in a couple of months, but um, yeah, there's a lot going on underneath the surface of the episode. Yeah, so like those earlier episodes and whatnot, there was a lot to dissect. You know, forgive mm -hmm. my mind. Um, but yeah, there was a lot in those episodes versus the ones that are in the later. I mean, you could still get something uh, in terms of a message with those later ones, but like the second one was really you know the best mm -hmm. one for me. Yeah. Um. If Tales was brought back, what essential factors do you think are necessary to make the fans happy overall? Well, I mean, that's a flawed question because yeah, you know, know. to get the fans happy, you know, it's it's a fool's errand. Oh, I know. Um, it would need to be f funny, I think, or at least ironic. You, you really have the irony. 
Yeah. People ask this question a lot and I kind of have a canned answer where I don't really want a remake per se. Well, what the what I would do, I wouldn't want a straight up Tales from the Crypt remake because I I just don't think us I think the chances of them recapturing that magic is extremely slim. Lightning in a bottle. Well, yeah, it's very much lightning in the bottle. And, and to be honest, you know, the the batting average for Tales from the Crypt, I don't know. It's probably better than most anthologies, but is it perfect? But no, but by no means. Well, if, the reason why I think Tales from the Crypt works is because the, it's all about the Crypt Keeper. So no matter what, the Crypt Keeper segment always hits. It's you know you get, you get that. It's like a it's like a meal. So you got that great appetizer of the Crypt Keeper to kind of get you settle you in. You have the episodes only about twenty to twenty four minutes, depending on the episode. So even if it's not a great episode, it's in and out. You know, it's not going to overstay its welcome. And then you have the Crypt Keeper again at the, at the end. That's your little dessert. So it's like a great meal. The entree can be hit and miss, but you'll always just leave satisfied because you went in feeling good, you left feeling good. And you always get your um, mashed potatoes. Right. <laughs> so if the only way to really do it, I think, would they'd have to figure out some way to do something like that where you have to revive the Crypt Keeper, and you know find a way to do it that's still going to be relevant and still funny um and then you have to do the episodes in and out like they like they used to well again what i've said what i would rather see is like kind of a mad men type of drama about ec comics you know where where, about the workings of the bill gaines era and then they can they can even juxtapose that with Tales from the Crypt, the show, kind of behind the scenes, you could have like Alan Katz and Gil and the, um, I'm, I'm liking his name, Bill. Uh, Bill Taylor? Yeah, Bill Taylor. Um, you know, the, the making of the show itself. So I would have like two time periods and they kind of switch back and forth. So you can still reference the show itself and have like a little behind, like making of the scenes and stuff, um, right. segments or whatever. You can cut pepper those in. Um, but I think that would work much better than just doing a straight up, you know, adaptation of the comics. I actually, you know, I, I love that concept. That's a very, that's a very well thought out concept. I mean, especially with the whole, um, madman, you know, element there being a part of it. And, you know, just like you said that, you know, you're, 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 you're seeing easy comics being formed. It's established. They're going through the comics code. They're even going through the, uh, the, the trial. The yeah. And then you're mm-hmm. seeing a little bit. Or, I mean, it, it could either play out the way you talked about, or we go chronologically, where we actually see EC being formed, and they're going through all the years of you know seeing those comics being. You know, it would be nice to see those comics reprinted, just to see them burnt out, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, and then we see the tales, uh, Amicus film being produced, and then we can see like you no know, them talking about like let's let's get HBO on the phone and see what we can get. <laughs> Uh, gains on this right. you know like i think that'd be beautiful to see yeah i mean not to mention the fact that it also was the reason why we had the comics book uh comic book code you know i would love yeah, to see that, that but, yeah so yeah um, i think that, that i think that's where a much more original interesting story would be yeah absolutely i agree with you 100 percent. final question could the show last as long as the original run knowing what the culture is like now in terms of entertainment and media yeah i mean that, that, that's that's the really tough part i think we're in such there's such a culture of instant feedback and just glut in a way like the fact that we have um you know a game of thrones prequel and the lord of the rings tv show and like now the one is like you know captured the public consciousness completely right. like it's i feel like we're in an age of like almost too much i know i might this might be feeling like old man where everyone's like, oh, there's just too much happening right now. But I feel like in the movies, this has been such a great year for horror and genre movies. It's almost like too much. Like I just don't have the time to sit down and watch everything. Yeah. Like, you know, we've had how many Star Wars TV shows in this year? It's in, in Marvel TV shows. Yeah. It's like, I, like, I can't keep up. I feel like that has something um, to do with digital filming being more accessible to a lot of different companies nowadays. Like, Film and maybe there was, yeah. Yeah, film production was a lot harder to 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 create and get into production, uh, considering like, because think about it, okay, like you have a film going to production, it would take the number of years it would make to 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 make the film, 
And then you also have home video production, which, you know, you didn't see a film in on VHS or uh, Laserdisc to like what? Mm -hmm. A year, year or two later? Like six months, yeah. Sometimes, or, depends. Yeah, yeah. So like now, like everything's digital. So like it's all in, in a video file. So all you got to do right now is put out a movie. It's either up on HBO Max same day or it's put out within a month or two on Netflix. Mm -hmm. So I mean, yeah. it's completely different than what it used to be. Right. So it's like, so I don't know. I and again, again with the, with a kind of like instant feedback that you can get because of social media now. Like you know, there's no time to digest anything, and I think some of these show episodes need like time to digest and percolate. You can't just like watch it and tweet blast about it, you know, immediately. You need time to like sit with it. Um, yeah. So, who knows <laughs> if they made the, if they try to make the show now? I don't know. It was, I'm not saying nothing's impossible. You know, you can find if they can make a Peacemaker TV show that's brilliant as it is. You know. Anything's possible. Absolutely, I 100% I agree. Uh, the way the Tales franchise can go, if it was brought back from the dead, uh, at least in my opinion, like it'll, if they push the boundaries and they try to relate it a little bit more to how the shock value and shock factor, what the EC Comics did, with that level of irony that's presented, um, yeah, you got you have a home run on your hands at the same time. Like there's just people who probably wouldn't get it and, and, and you know then it's already being ostracized on social media whatever the case may be getting canceled or you know some people like it some people love it you know it's just that that duality of you know reception mm -hmm. uh in, in the whole in the whole franchise and you know the 90 like if, if you put on tales from the 90s obviously fans like you and i we, we understand what they're doing John Kassir knows what the, the comics were doing. John Kassir knew what the show was doing mm -hmm. when he first signed on to play the Crypt Keeper. And everyone in the cast and crew knew what they were doing. The public reception on HBO, because that's, that, that's why we had the syndicated versions on Fox and we had the HBO versions. We had the censored. If you want to watch the uncensored, this is what you need to do. You need to buy HBO as a package because this is what you're going to get and this is what you're going to see. And you're not, like, if anyone's on Fox and whatnot and they get... You have kids who have you have kids who are probably still up at night on Fox and they see the Tales from the Crypt show and they're just like oh wow sex oh wow death violence all murder we were we were still in that age of you know Mortal Kombat is the reason why mm -hmm. there's violence in, in, in youth today that kind of stuff everyone was looking for something to pinpoint and blame for why there's violence you bring that show back nowadays oh god like that 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 show would boss that would possibly be the next reason at, or catalyst as to why there's violence in this country or violence in the world yeah i mean it, it's it it's not impossible i think it'd just be very hard to deal the threat okay oh. yeah. i'm right there with you okay so that ends the interview jason um i want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being a part of the uh the the crypt sent uh, interview uh segment being my first episode i really appreciate your time um, is there anything else that you want to uh, discuss with the uh, the fans right now, or you want anything you want to plug in in terms of your platforms, the channel, the podcast? Uh, well, first, thank you for having me. Um, you know, you're, you're you're my crit brother in this whole thing. You know, we're kind of carrying the torch for this show that you know hasn't been culturally relevant for thirty plus years, and you know, I think we're we're doing uh, our best to kind of one one inch, one pebble at a time. You know, build some recognition back to the show. So, you know, maybe it will reach a critical mass at some point, you know, or maybe it will just, you know, go our own ways, but um, I appreciate everything that you've been doing and all this stuff you put out. Um, like I said, we have our dads from the crypt episodes coming out every Sunday. Um, Al Katz is doing season two of the, how not to make a movie podcast, which is now focusing on other movies and other, you know, travel productions and still talking plenty of crypt stuff too. Um, so that's coming out usually Wednesday or Thursday, depending. And like I said, we have this new uh, segment called uh, Vault of Horror Collectors, which, you know, I don't know exactly what the release schedule is going to be, but we're just kind of coming, taking it as it goes. But um, again, we're on uh, Twitter at, uh, at Crypt Dads. Um, we're on Instagram at Dads of the Crypt. Those are the two best places to follow us. We're, we're active on the Reddit's. 
Uh, we have a YouTube channel under Dads for the Crypt. So it usually takes me like a week or two to get the videos up. I'll try to do them in batches. I, I don't quite understand. People want to want to watch a um, uh, watch a podcast, but hey, power to you if you want to. We appreciate it. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to spice up a, a couple things on YouTube. Um, we've got some merch on Redbubble. Um, great time for the holidays or for the creepy season. Um, and then we have our Patreon to you know if you want to support the show we love it and then we're working on some extra content for there it's very slow going but um we appreciate anyone that listens and anyone gives us anyone that gives me the time of day i'm willing to take it and i appreciate it but um again thank you for having me and uh we're both doing the demons work here so (laughs) no no but thank you it's a scapsolute pleasure to have you on this channel and have you you know feature your work and whatnot like it's it's an it's an honor for me to be honest (laughs) So uh, all the, the links and affiliated uh, sites that Jason had mentioned, they're all going to be mentioned down in the uh, description box. Make sure you check them out um, and subscribe, follow, listen to their podcast. They're, they are a great listen. I listen to them every single time I drive to work. I listen to them every single time I find downtime in the gym or whatever the case may be. How do you find downtime in the gym? Uh, wow. Should I not be lifting? Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, you got to go uh, take a break, go to the job, you know, you find your time. I mean, sometimes I'm lifting and I'm still listening to your podcast, man. <laughs> Getting the crazy so that, thanks for that image. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, please follow them. Make sure you listen to their podcast. You know, check out their links. Um, they'll all be in the description box one more time. So with that being said, I want to thank you all for joining the, uh, this episode of Sinterviews. And with that being said, have a good fright and pleasant screams. Bye-bye. Happy spooky season.